I'm Ryan Newman, and since I started with Indiana Donor Network and Driven to Save Lives, I found out that some people think that they can't be an organ donor. The truth is, anyone can sign up to be an organ donor. Anyone? Anyone? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Anyone can sign up to be an organ donor. So don't count yourself out because somebody's counting on you. Go to DrivenToSaveLives.org and sign up today. But my heart's going to you, right? Love that shirt. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. More iRacing action here on the National Racing Network. A lot coming up for you here. Kicking things off for the TNT Shock Series. Our second dip of the doubleheader, so to speak. Looking forward to a good one here. 50 minutes of racing action will start first with qualifications coming up here in just a moment. My name is Chris Graham. Joined in the booth, as always, by Mr. Patrick Byrne. And uh, I'll tell you what here, Bizzle. It looks like 14 cars on the entry list. And these drivers are talking about the possibility of physical fitness being important tonight. What in the heck is going on here in Nashville? Yeah, these drivers are going to have to come with their A game. I, if you don't go to the gym every day, you don't work out all the time, this is going to be a tough race for you, especially if you're on nicer hardware. If you're on an old Driving Force GT, you might be all right with this one, but this is a very physical track to try and get around. I see what you did there, and you know what? We're discussing the BMI of drivers and how that could come into play. How? I have no idea. But if they're talking that way, my Driving Force GT would do just fine here tonight, I will have you know. Almost everybody... Except, <laughs> these drivers are going to be doing a lot of shifting here, and I don't believe your Driving Force GT does that very consistently. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Uh, it'll give me whatever gear it wants to at the moment. Daniel Miglin, the first car to get a lap in in qualifications. Now Mike Long going to head to the top of the board. 16.188 second lap. Simon Fell, fourth quick. As he finishes up his qualification run, we'll pick up the PPG Shell V Power, number three of Jason Miller. Vic Aldrich, new quick time, 16, 174, 16, 17 with a four for Vic Aldrich. Lap number two on the board for Jason Miller. That will be good enough for six quick. Love to see Kevin Smalley out here on the racetrack. The 47 out here doing some fun things. Lap number one for Smalley, 16, 288. Also on the speedway, the guy who was quickest in practice, Jason Owens, finishing up his qualification run, 16.109. And remember, it is two lap average qualifications. So if you screw up the first lap somehow, you might be out of luck. Kevin Smalley only going to be good enough for knife quick. Steven C. Thompson finishing up his qualification run. He'll be in the 10th position, 16.445. Now, the number 16 Homestead Coffee entry of West Shire getting out onto pit lane. Looks like Wes is going to wait before he comes out on the racetrack. Yeah, and trying to burn down as much fuel as possible. Seeing some I'm not sure why. These are open setup cars. You can fuel it as much or as little as you want for qualifying. Uh, yeah, but there is a minimum, though, that you have to take. I guess that is right, yeah. So you try to burn off even that little bit. Drivers have two sets of tires available to them. And that will be a key tonight, trying to avoid the chaos and carnage. So we see the back end step out on West Shire. Coming close to putting that car up into the fence. It's lap number one on the board for Shire, 16-407. We'll see what lap number two is going to look like. Waiting for James Watson and Drew Berry to get out onto the speedway. Derek Cat, unfortunately, will not get a qualification run completed. Lap number two for Shire is going to be good. It's going to put him mid-pack at a 16-267. 
As now there's Watson trying to grab some gravity through three and four. He will see the green flag to start his qualification run. Andrew Berry, very iffy if he will be on the speedway here tonight. He did do some practice laps, but he may have withdrawn, which would leave us at a 13 car entry list. Now down to 40 seconds remaining. What looks like the final car in time trials will be James Watson. Oh, this is a good run, too. He's going to be third quick. 16-1-9-3 will be the best lap for James Watson. And that will round out the qualifying session. And it looks like, I believe, it'll be Vic Aldrich that will be on the pole here for tonight's race. Jason Owens setting a faster lap, but Aldrich claiming the two-lap average. And qualifications are done here for the TNT Shock Series. It should be, uh, yes, 50 minutes on the clock here for this one tonight. And let's take a look. I wonder if we have. Let's see how. Oh, that one looks looks good, and the race cars sound fantastic. So we'll use this one here to give you your starting grid for tonight's race. On the pole for tonight's TNT Shock Series event from the Nashville Fairgrounds. Your pole center, the Dizzy V Designs. Team Watson Racing Setups, number 98 of Vic Aldrich. To the outside, the number 87 of Jason Owens. Only 10 thousandths of a second separating those two. James Watson just as quick in the National Racing Network. Team Watson Racing, ZAS Designs, number 39. To his outside will be the number 21 of Mike Long. Row number three tonight will have the AJ Camargo of Brazil and Brian Labarge. Row number four, West Shire, the Homestead Coffee, tails from Rukai Schaefer Oil, number 16. To the outside, the triple five of Daniel Miglin. Jason Miller, the PPG Shell V Power, number three, inside of row five. To his outside, TNT Shock National Racing Network, number 256 of Simon Fell. Kevin Smalley in the unsponsored 47, lining up inside of row number six. To his outside, the player one, number 24, is Stephen C. Thompson. Andrew Berry and Derek Catt are scheduled to make up the final row of the grid, but Berry will be a withdrawal. So only 13 cars on the entry list here tonight. Robert Kreiser checking in. What's going on, buddy? Enjoy the show. This one's going to be fun. 50 minutes of racing action. Please, gentlemen, don't want them up into turn one. Fields off of turn number four. Great flag in the air. We're underway. sliding. That's going to be West Shire. How in the world did West save that race car? Did he save that? I don't believe he did. I thought I saw a tire fly off that thing. Looks like he's going to have to come down pit lane. Oh, yeah. He's jugged. West Shire wrecks off of turn number two on the opening lap. That's not good for the championship hopes. His night's going to come to an early close. Finishing early, a subject Bizzle absolutely fantastic at. Take a look at take a look at the NRN replay. See what happened here to West Shire. Oh, a little bit of a touch. Oh. Wow, that was a huge hit. That race car is gonna be done. Wow. 
Watson, currently the fastest car on the racetrack by a long shot right now, still pulling away from Vic Aldridge. Pulling away from Vic, and I talked about it briefly during the sprint car broadcast, but we also talked about it last night during the Silver Crowns. With a shorter field, lap traffic may come into play less. There's only 12 cars on the racetrack right now. 12th place, Derek Cat, four seconds back. It's going to be a very long time before Watson catches lap traffic. In fact, he may not catch lap traffic before they have to make a pit stop. So at this point, I'm not necessarily against the strategy call here by Watson. This is get out in front and go. Yeah, if they can stay clean and green, I, he's pretty much going to be set until they have to come down pit lane. I, the only thing that screws this strategy up is you have a limited set of tires, and if the caution comes out, you lose all of that time made up by burning those tires off and running away from the field. Yeah, and when we look at a 40, you know, 50 minute race, if you're going to split it up into thirds, you're talking what, every 17 minutes or so, 18 minutes? You're going to have, yeah, about, actually, more than that, 20, about 20 minutes almost, I guess 18, 19 minutes. If you're going to try to split it into thirds, that kind of puts you in danger as well and locks you into that strategy. Yeah, early on in these Oh, races, there's oh. The contact! Aldrich and Owens into the inside wall. Caution is out. Owens' car looks all right. Aldrich, not so much. He's missing the rear wing. They can replace that as long as suspension's not damaged, but you can see that right rear tire hanging about a half an inch up in the air. Uh, yeah, looks Vic Aldrich has to take the toe. Take a look at the replay here. See what happened. It'll be the next time off of turn number two. In fact, we're going to go to the drone camera for this one. Owens able to get the run down to the inside. Oh, Owens just got a little bit loose, slides up the racetrack. Nothing Vic Aldrich could do there. And almost looked like not much that Jason Owens could do either, quite frankly. Yes, yeah, side-by-side is not something you want to sit at for very long in this track. You want to get under someone, make the move, and run away from them. Race control saying a meatball to both the 87 and 98. So Aldrich and Owens will be on pit lane for an extended period of time, it seems like. So that brings the field down to 10 cars. 10 cars remaining, and we're not even five minutes into this thing. Nashville might be the toughest track on the schedule. Uh, well, physically, it's tough. And from a setup perspective, it was tough, too. I can remember the first time we ran here. It was either the race that everybody wrecked or it was the race that Oisheen Walsh beat the entire field by four or five laps. It was something dumb like that. Th this That first race was the Oisheen Walsh race. That was my uh, Gordon Smiley set race where I figured out the hack that Oisheen was using and it was me and him on the lead lap. He was still about half a lap ahead of me for the entire race. And it was the closest I had ever gotten to being up there with him. And then thing just snapped out of four on me and he ended up whooping the whole field by four or five laps. Uh, well, let's bring up Jason Owens into the booth here. Unfortunately, car 87 has retired. Uh, Jason, what happened out there? You guys probably know better than me. I, I don't know if I was being too aggressive too early or I, I thought Victor was going to keep going out towards the wall and thought I had room and we bored. So I, I'll go back and take a look at it and talk to Victor, but I, I don't think there's any fault in their, in their car. I don't know. Um, we'll see. Like I said, you guys saw it better than I did. Uh, well, a very Two cars going. Did, oh, go ahead, Bizzle. To say two cars going for the same piece of real estate. He didn't track out as far as you thought he was going to, and your car looked like it just snapped a little bit and pushed up high and ended up in the same spot. Yeah, I know. I, I should have been more patient overall. It's my fault. You know, I had a, had a freaking missile under me tonight, and uh, I threw it away. It's the ID10T air. That's all on me. 
Well, tough break, Jason Owens. A very dejected and sounding Jason Owens. Uh, not getting to run every race this season, and you hate to go out early like that. Wes Shire, I would imagine, is going to be just as frustrated. Well, he is down in the booth, so we'll see if we can talk to him at some point here as well. But now as the field goes green at lap number 17, with, like we said, still over 40 minutes left in this race, does that heat cycle early on hurt these drivers, or does it give them maybe even a little bit of help just to say, hey, I've now got one heat cycle under them. If we get another one, I'm going to have to change. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to hurt you more than it helps you. You can see Watson not getting out to nearly as far of a lead from Camargo. Camargo running, I believe, the same set as Watson. Both those cars, TWRS cars. Uh, and I think Camargo has the faster lap. So I think you're going to see these two run away from the field a little bit. But Watson, again, either of those two cars, not running away from everyone like they were in the first stage. Yeah, the AJ Camargo has the fastest lap by two one thousandths of a second. A 16-120 to a 16-122. But now Brian Labarge starting to get up here, and he's going to hassle the AJ a little bit. Does that kind of spook you a little bit as a driver when you see two talented cars going out very early in the race like that, where it kind of just makes you go, you know what, I don't have to race right now. Uh, it can. It absolutely can. Uh, especially when those are some of the top talents of the series. Been running this car for all five or six years that this car has been released. I, when you see something like that, you, you kind of got to step back a little bit and pace yourself. And keep in mind, this track has a huge bump coming off of turn two and turn number four that'll absolutely rip this thing out of your hands. Well, we just saw that out of Brian Labarge. He was inside of the AJ Camargo entering turn number three. Had to back right out of it. Now he resets the car. Almost lost the spot to Daniel Miglin. Now going right back on the attack on that 59 machine. Yeah, again, it's just going to come down to patience, though. You have to sit there behind the driver and kind of force them into making a mistake here. This is not a track that I want to sit and battle side by side, crossover after crossover. This is a track where I want to sit right behind someone, let them bottle up and get by him before we make it to the next corner. Well, and at this point, every driver that's on the racetrack looks poised to earn a top 10 finish here tonight. Now, it's obviously not saying a lot when you only started 14, 13 cars on the grid. But when you think about the points championship, Every position matters. For somebody like Jason Miller, Mike Long, Simon Fell, the guys running 5th, 6th, and 7th, this is now an opportunity for them to score a very, very big points night, basically by not being dumb. Absolutely. I, unlike the official races, this is a league. We run the same points for first place, whether there's 10 cars or 20 cars in the field. It's not like your strength to field changes the amount of points you're going to earn. So... You might have only start at 10. The worst you can finish is 10th. And, hey, that might be a good day for you if you're usually a 17, 18 place driver. But if you keep your head on and some of these real fast guys wreck themselves even more, this could be a fantastic day. You can get a top five finish, maybe earn yourself 30, 40 points for the night instead of earning four or five for the night. Uh, yeah, and the top four have now gotten pretty much nose to tail here as they get back to turn number three. Of note, if they have to make a green flag pit stop, this pit entry and pit exit is borderline evil. I don't know if they have to enter pit lane off of turn number three. Race control will be able to tell us that. But basically, you get to kind of the middle of three and four, and it's just a hard left-hand turn to get on the pit lane. Uh, and McCullen is checking in saying off the back straight away. So you have to commit to pit lane kind of here. But it's not easy to get on and off a of pit lane. Oh, it was Mike Long, I think, with a big shot into the outside retaining wall that time. Going to no, allow... This pit lane is very, very similar to how you get on and off at Dover, where if there's just no room for error, no room to even get on pit lane. You kind of have to park it in the apex and drop down and get it. So race leaders checking out a little bit here. It's going to be a 1.5 second gap between fourth place Daniel Miglin and fifth place Jason Miller. That runs just up ahead of Mike Long and Simon Bell here. Kevin Smalley in this group also. 
And now I would tend to think these drivers are going to have to settle in for the long run and just kind of expect that this race is going to go green for the next 38 and a half minutes. I, I, I wouldn't bet on that. I would definitely bet on a yellow coming out at some point during this race. I, this is just such a hard track, even as a single car by yourself to get around. There's going to be someone spinning out, hitting a wall at some point. Slide back up to the battle here for the race lead. Daniel Miglin trying some different lines as Camargo, Labarge, and Miglin continue to follow James Watson. Watson has led 35 of the 36 completed laps. Vic Aldrich has the other lap led. Unfortunately, he is out of this race and in position number 11. He's not out yet. He is still getting that car repaired on pit lane. I, up until maybe the 20 minutes to go mark, I'd say that's a fair call. Get that car fixed, get out on track, run some laps. If you have some attrition in this one, you could pick up a spot or two, which gets you into the top 10 and gets you a whole ton of points. Well, yeah, even for West Shire, it's uh, a 10-lap difference to 11th place Vic Aldridge. Like you said, it's only two, but it still would be two spots if you can get yourself 10 laps turned. As Mike Long, I think, may have made contact with the outside wall exiting turn two a handful of laps ago. Yep, That's finishing... So the points, they, they kind of go up exponentially. So finishing 13th where Wes is right now is 12 points. If he can break into 11th, that is 15 points. So that is three points for those two spots. If he can break into 10th, that's another two points, and he would get 17. Yes, the, the it's not convoluted but like the old NASCAR system used to be, but it is a... It, like you said, it's exponential, and every point is worth, every position is worth more points. And then you factor in some of the bonuses. This one is really going to hurt West Shire in the championship battle tonight. It, it, I, I think I have a bone to pick with Wes. I hope he's listening in while he's getting that car repaired. So you finish 11th, that's 15. You finish 10th, that's 17. You finish 9th, you only earn one more point. That's only 18. But you finish 8th, that's 20 points. It jumps another 2. So it is just as convoluted as NASCAR. Copy that. Sounds about right. Daniel Bigland getting around Brian LaBarge on the outside. Interesting way to make that pass for Miglin. We have not seen anybody have to go up to the high side of the racetrack. The track conditions are absolutely perfect. 77 degree ambient, 81 degree track temperature. However, with the cars turning as many laps as they are, they will be grip hunting by the time these tires have worn out. Yeah, I think you're gonna see the line move up further and further. You can see Watson still leaving about a car or car width up to that outside wall as he exits four. I think you're gonna see these drivers creep closer and closer to scraping that outside wall. And of note, he's not down on the yellow line anymore either. So it's almost like the, the racing line is narrowing ever so slightly. So then the question becomes, do you have to wait as long as possible to take tires? just to keep that extra set for late in the race. I would think so, although we don't do overtime. It's not like you're saving a set for overtime. You know exactly when this race is going to end. You know the sweet spot, take those tires. Maybe if you want to wait till later, take them with 15 to go. That might be the latest that I take those, that final set. Yeah, I would think the pit window is going to open up here in... Uh, well, let's see. We're about 17 minutes in. Uh, so, yeah, actually, it's kind of open about now if you wanted to split the race into thirds. If you're looking to make it to halfway, which would be the ideal strategy, at least initially, uh, that would get you, if you could get just past 25 minutes remaining, that means you could take a full tank of fuel, make it to the end of the race, and then you would only use one set of tires on that pit stop. But it feels like these cars are just going to get absolutely evil handling. Brian Labarge very quickly loose off of turn number four, and he has fallen back a wide margin here. In fact, 
he may be caught by Jason Miller and Kevin Smalley very quickly. Interesting bit of minutia here. Kevin Smalley running in the sixth position actually has a faster 15 lap average than race leader James Watson does. Tells me that Watson is doing a little bit of pace controlling here at the front of the field, trying not to burn his stuff up. But everybody throughout the field is running almost identical lap times. Yeah, and th that is always the worst when everyone is going just about the same amount of fast. Nobody's catching each other. Nobody's losing each other either. And it's just frustrating for everyone. Getting word from race control, incidents on laps 1 and 11 have been noted and will be reviewed post-race. Now Smalley really going to work here on Jason Miller. Ryan LaBarge has picked the pace back up. He's within three tenths of Daniel Minglin. We'll stay with this battle though as Smalley looks inside of Miller into one and two. Man, these cars are so squirrely off the two. And now while this battle is going on, Brian LaBarge getting around Daniel Miglin. Puts him back up into a podium position. Miller not going quietly into the good night, though. He's trying to hold off Simon Fell and at the same time battle with Kevin Smalley as we've got one car heading for pit lane, I believe. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure who that was. Oh, that was the nine of Derek Hatt getting on to pit lane. And, uh, maybe. I'm not seeing anybody on pit lane at the moment, but timing is scoring, not updating just yet. Slide back forward here, pick up your race leaders as we are down to 30 minutes remaining. If we don't see them in the next couple of minutes, James, or uh, yeah, Patrick, I would figure we're not going to see them until the halfway point. Yeah, I, I would think you're going to wait till the halfway point. I, if there's Especially if you could try and make it a one-stop race. If you can make it a one-stop race, that's all the better. Just because of how long it's going to take you to get down pit lane. And then if we get a late race caution, that gives you the extra set in the box. I'll tell you what, this Watson car looks really hooked up here. He moved up about half a lane. But he still is not having to use every bit of the racetrack to the outside wall. That 39 machine is absolutely on rails here tonight. Pick up the AJ Camargo and Brian Labarge. Camargo in the NRN Exorcist cam trying to chase down James Watson. Swinging around here, though. There's Brian Labarge looking right out. The backside, I love the wing. Green car, watch out. And you can hear the car bottom out through turn four. These bumps are just big. So we figured out the mystery of the points. 
I I'm seeing that. Go ahead. Wes borrowed the real world Indie Pro 2000 points for our point system, which perfectly explains why there's a random gap between one point and two points. Like, it alternates between positions for a while in the mid range, where it goes two points between 10th and 9th, but one point between 10th and 11th, and then two points between 11th and 12th, and then one point between 12th and 13th. Why? <laughs> Probably for the same reason that they, uh, well, yeah, we're not even going to go there. I don't want to piss off Anderson Promotions. How about this one? Daniel Minglin has fallen back into the grips of Kevin Smalley, Jason Miller. Even Simon Fell, Stephen C. Thompson going to be right there. This battle is going to get hot and heavy here. I think before we see that these cars have to stop for tires, and now the problem becomes... Miglitz heavy on the defense. Miller now going on the attack on Kevin Smalley. And they are about out of rubber at this point. Yeah, all of these cars are going to get ready to come down pit, er, pit lane soon. Oh, Miglitz way up the racetrack. Victoria Renzi checking in saying vroom. I need to go watch this back and take the sound clip of you saying vroom right there. It's going to be my new intro sound. <laughs> Have fun with that one, buddy. God, that's even better. <laughs> I'll give you some material to work with. <laughs> so Miglin has fallen all the way back to the eighth position. He is holding on for dear life. Mike Long also coming past now. So Miglin back into the ninth position. And James Watson has opened up eight tenths of a second on the AJ Camargo. Camargo battling with Brian Labarge. So now just one minute remaining to the halfway point. Miglin is on pit lane. Derek Catt is also on pit lane. So now let's see what the lap times for Miglin are going to look like. Is this he going is, to be way quicker? I No, these tires take lots of time to actually get up to camp and be usable. But big thing to note is we are big time in the danger zone right now. That He is two laps down from the rest of the field. If the caution were to come out, that's pretty much race over. There's no way you're getting two laps back. Yeah, they, we do have the wave around now, but that only gets you one. I guess you would, in theory, be able to make up one when the leaders come down, maybe? Yeah, you'd make up one when all of the leaders come down. And then you would make the... Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if you would be able to get around quick enough. That, that would be your wave around, is when all of the leaders come into pits. You would, egg, you would be in front of them, but you wouldn't pick up a lap on the racetrack from them being in the pits under yellow. Yeah. Of note, Daniel Miglin's last lap, he looks like he's slicing through the leaders like a hot knife through butter, right? His last lap, 14-498. Last lap for James Watson, 4-4-4. Four, four, four. They are almost identical lap times. New tires versus really old tires. Yeah, and Miglin's one and only job right now is get himself out of the danger zone. Get yourself only one lap down, so God forbid the caution were to come out, you can get the wave around and get yourself back in the lead lap. This strategy could work if it stays green, and it could work if the caution were to come out and he gets by Watson. If he's behind Watson, his night's over. Just park it. A 
let's pick up your race leader. None of the top three are making their way onto pit lane yet, although Niege Camargo really falling back. And Brian Labarge just set a new fastest lap of the race on crazy old tires at a 16103. So everything about tires, just throw it out the window. Unless they're going to tell us post-race that it was sketchy as all get out. So Miglin has gotten himself back to one lap down now. And Labarge is flying. He's caught up to race leader James Watson. Well, the AJ Camargo may have gotten the outside wall. Exiting turn two that last time by. And like you said, Patrick, with how long it takes these tires to come up to temperature, you're talking four or five laps, really, to get them into a usable range. And they're not really good until about 10 laps into the run. I would think your leaders probably want to stop sooner than later. That's what I'm saying. About 15 minutes left is the absolute latest I would take those tires. Because you saw that Brian Labarge is still out there setting fast laps. The only thing that worries me about that is these tires get really, really good before they get incredibly bad. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like the motor in a car. It runs great. Absolutely best it's ever run right before it blows up. That's why I'm not worried about my truck. It runs like crap every time I start it. <laughs> as soon as it doesn't misfire on startup, that's what I'm worried about. Only your top five have not made their pit stops yet. Watson, Labarge, Thompson, Miller, and Long. The AJ Camargo has made his pit stop. Did so one and a half laps ago as now Mike Long is on pit lane. It almost feels like if you're Brian Labarge, make the stop now. You can kind of force James Watson's hand a little bit because he's going to have to stop to cover your, your maneuver. I... Yeah, and that gives you a gap to Watson as well, where you can, you're can you not stuck behind him trying to figure out a way to get by. On the flip side, Brian Labarge's car is the fastest it's been all night. I, I'm not sure I'd want to give that up. It's almost like taking the overcut is the move for Labarge, and taking the undercut is the move for Watson. If I was Watson, I would dive in the pit lane right now. Uh, well, maybe not, though, because at this point, Labarge is not ready to pass and you're kind of holding that car up. Now, he could be trying to save a little fuel to make a two or three lap run, but if you're Labarge, that almost has to be the strategy call. Wait for Watson to pit and try to set three or four qualifying laps before you have to come in and build the gap that way. Yeah, right now, this is chess at a short track at 100 miles an hour. Jason Miller is on pit lane, and it looks like here comes race leader James Watson. Oh, and Watson slides up onto the racetrack, back down onto pit lane. Is that a penalty? He uh -huh. crossed over that yellow line before he entered the pits. We will wait to hear from race control if there is a penalty to be assessed there. Watson hits the marks. The car will go up on the jacks. Four fresh Cooper tires and enough fuel to get to the end of this thing. Race control and McCullen saying no action taken on James Watson. Oh man, James, we've got to watch the, the pit exit line is now Brian Labarge is on pit lane. Steven C. Thompson is your race leader. He is playing the extreme overcut strategy. Basically, if there's a caution flag, he's going to be the only car left on the lead lap. 
he gets a free pit stop and gets to keep the lead. Here comes Watson off of turn number two, and he will easily clear Brian LaBarge. 25.8 seconds on pit lane for Watson. 26.6 for Brian LaBarge. Stop time difference, 7, 5 to 8, 3. And that's your gap right now. It, it just comes down to who put less fuel in the car. Uh, yeah, right now it's sitting at 1.2 seconds is the gap. And it basically was two tenths before they came down pit lane. So that one second difference in the pit stop. And that is a completely randomized thing by iRacing. Randomized or needed to take more fuel? Is Watson going to be tight on fuel to get to the end of this thing? I don't know. A full tank of 6.3 gallons got him all the way here. He probably only has to fill it with up to four gallons. If there was still a gallon in the tank, he only had to splash it with three. But we are waiting for Steven C. Thompson to hit pit lane. Now, this car has not been fast all, all night. He's been kind of a mid-pack car. Is he trying some goofy strategy play to kind of just half throttle his way around this place and try to make it without stopping? Uh, there's, there's no not a way. chance he makes it without stopping. A bicycle would run out of fuel before the end of this race. <laughs> Pick up James Watson. He is under attack. Brian Labarge just set a new fastest lap of the race. And he did it again. He's almost he down into the 15s. And remember, these cars are a lap now to race leader Stephen C. Thompson. And the other thing that is important to note is inside of five minutes remaining, there is a quick yellow procedure. So basically, as soon as the pace car picks up the race leader, they go back the one to green that first time by the start finish line. So no circulating under caution for several minutes, waiting for lap cars to get a shot. Oh, as Watson throws a huge block off at two that time. Oh man. Wow, Labarge big dive into three. He'll go full send, and Labarge will pick up the lap. Well, no, he won't get the lap led because Stephen C. Thompson's just now on pit lane. In fact, he's down and away. 6.8 second stop for Thompson. Oh, man, if I was Thompson, if I could see these guys battling side by side, I would have held out just a little bit longer. There's no way they could keep this clean and green running side by side like this well and this fight is really good there's another one this whole second pack that thompson is now at the head of back through seventh place daniel miglin you see them coming off the corner oh, oh, thompson gets very loose steven c thompson almost into the inside wall that's gonna stack everybody up and right as we look away from it labarge grabs the lead look back here at this fight because this one is so good Camargo, Miglin and Fell all battling hot and heavy 
with 13 and a half minutes remaining. Thompson makes the big dive on Smalley for position number three. Just getting word from race control. Blocking by car 39 noted. Not there was sure. another blocking incident that happened last week that was also noted as well. i not sure I have much more comments than that to say, but definitely something that's going to be looked at. Well, and is there a penalty structure in race? And quite frankly, do you make that call right now if you're in the race control seat? I would say if it, con it continues, uh, verbal warning after that, uh, your race control, you can throw whatever flag you want. You want to park them for a lap? Park them for a lap. You want to disqualify them? Disqualify them. That is up to race control's discretion. I'm glad I'm not sitting in that seat. Yeah. Oh, the AJ Camargo. Big arrow wash. Oh, Behind contact. Kevin Smalley in contact there with Daniel Miglin. The gap for Brian LaBarge over James Watson is up to six tenths of a second. With 11 and change minutes left to go here. Oh, Camargo way loose off of two that time. These guys are really pushing now. C. Thompson, by the way, has absolutely checked out on this group of cars. And Watson is starting to close the gap on LaBarge here. It's now down to four tenths. Ticks back up over five briefly. Smalley putting in a pretty good run here. We don't get to see him as often as we used to here in the TNT Shock Series. Having a good run tonight and battling the AJ Camargo, who, oh, what, last season got his first Shock Series win, I think it was? It's been a while. Camargo turning into one of those guys that we're used to seeing up front on the regular here. And a big bobble for James Watson. He's back to a now eight tenths of a second back of Brian LaBarge. Oh, Watson may have gotten into the outside wall. That car still looks like it's tracking pretty straight, so he might have gotten away with that one. Yeah, we've talked about it in the past that you can kind of pancake it to the wall and it won't do a ton of damage. It's when you hit either the front corner or the back corner and then the other end makes the contact. That's when you do the damage to it. Back to this fight between Camargo and Miglin. It's allowing Simon Fell to escape ever so slightly. As we are now inside of nine minutes remaining. Nine minutes and about 35 laps to go. These drivers are going to be flat exhausted.
outside of a couple of caution free races, about the longest green flag run that we've had. Maybe 25, 30 minutes. Watson again starting to close the gap. It's down to eight tenths of a second as Miglin and Camargo almost make contact into three. Brian LaBarge does not want to see a yellow right now. Oh, as Smalley almost got into the fence, I think Camargo did too. Yeah, uh, these guys are trying to bring out the caution. If I'm LaBarge, I want to see the caution come out before the five minute mark. Run more of that clock off under yellow than the quickie yellow that we would see with less than five minutes to go as the AJ Camargo did pick up a meatball flag from that wall contact. He will have to head to pit lane. And now we are down to eight cars remaining on the racing surface and all of them are on the lead lap. At some point here, does discretion become the better part of Valor? Where you just go, you know what? I'm good with fifth. If, if you're Dan Miglin, I'm, I'm cool here in fifth. I don't have to race these guys. Absolutely not. You came here to go and race. You're right there. You're on his gearbox right now. You've gotten below him a couple times. If you feel you can get the past some, absolutely. I want to go and show him I can get fourth. Well, and looking at the chart of points, uh, the difference between fifth, fourth, and third is pretty huge. get a caution here in the next 37 seconds. Do you stop if you're Watson, Thompson, Smalley, any of these guys? I don't believe so. If enough of those cars behind you don't stop, all of a sudden you had what was a guaranteed top five finish. To Now you got to fight for it. If you bring out another caution, you're probably not going to And the caution's out! Yellow flag is out. Trouble on the racetrack for Derek Cat. And it is just before the quickie yellow period. See what happened here to Cat. Oh, the car just twitched a little bit. Spun down to the inside and with the oncoming traffic. Absolutely, the caution needs to come out. But now we're going to get our answer to this question. Watson stays out, as does Thompson. Daniel Miglin will come in. He's only going to lose two spots in the process. Uh, let's see. LaBarge is server muted. Watson is server muted. So I don't know that any of these guys are going to want to talk to us. And we did get the quickie yellow. Lights are out. We're going back racing. It will be an eight-car shootout for the race win. Green flag back in the air. Nice start for LaBarge. Watson almost had it time perfect.
what was a comfortable more than one second lead for Brian Labarge is now back to being a tight fight with James Watson and Stephen C. Thompson. He's kind of coming out of nowhere in this one. Up nine from where he qualified. Yeah, Thompson off to a great night. Even if he finishes third tonight, still up nine spots. I'll take that. Twelve circuits remaining, or thereabouts anyway. As we are now inside of three minutes to go, and Labarge is starting to open the lead back up. Watson fighting with Stephen C. Thompson. Oh, and Miglin slicing his way through the field. He's around Fell and Smalley and up to position number four. Smalley put up a great fight back, though. And now Thompson all over that rear attenuator and James Watson. Just 90 seconds remain here at the Nashville Fairgrounds. Brian Labarge absolutely putting on a clinic late in this race. Carr has been really good. And how about Miglin? He sets a new fastest lap of the race and he's almost caught up to Thompson and Watson. It's going to be another case just like last night of just one more lap. That's what I feel like. I can't believe you can remember last night. Was that? So he said Sunday fun day extended into Monday up there in Ohio for uh, Senor Bizzle. Yes, it did. Man, now Watson trying to hold off Thompson. Thompson's right in the middle of this hornet's nest. And Miglin's going to have the shot looking inside. 15 seconds to go. Next time by, it'll be the white flag. Maybe. Miglin's going to have to make the move here. Off of turn number four, I think it'll be, yes, white flag, one lap to go. Miglin around Thompson. He's going after Watson. Through three and four for the final time, Brian Labarge wins at the Nashville Fairgrounds. Drag race to the line, Watson holds on for second. And what a fight between Mike Long and Kevin Smalley for the sixth position. Let's take a look at this one on the replay. Wow. What a run to the line by Mike Long. Barely. Getting Kevin Smalley seven one thousandths of a second, separating sixth from seventh. Oh, what a great show these guys put on. Uh, I think Ryan Labarge is still burning the house down on the front stretch here. Uh, let's take a look. There we go. He's buried in the fence at the moment. 
Now he decides to back out of it. Let's take a look. There we go. Get us a little bit more time here, and let's we'll pick things up from the restart, and we'll bring in our race winner, Mr. Brian Labarge. Uh, congratulations on the win, Brian. I think you have to be absolutely sweating because that caution was the last thing you wanted to see. It absolutely was. Um, I was not looking forward to that. Um, but on the same token, though, like I had every confidence that that car was going to be able to pull out a gap. Um, it was in every single condition uh, throughout the race. I always felt like the car had pace. I, I felt like I never really had to, um, you know, really conserve a little bit. Um, like I, I knew that if I needed to push, I could do it. It was there. But other than that, like that car was it was literally doing everything i wanted it to for for the most part there were a couple times in the mid first stint where it was being a little bit weird on me but other than that like in a little bit of clean space and everything else it was just absolutely on rails uh, yeah the car was on rails and when we thought your tires should have been shot you were setting fastest laps of the race how were you able to do that was there just not the tire fall off that you expected or or what was the what was going on there uh Honestly, I don't. I I was expecting the tires to fall off too. Um, I don't know if it was just the track just gripped up towards the end, um, but I, I expected that you know just based off the testing that I, that I was doing, I, I couldn't get something that was going to be, uh, you know, where numbers were looking like okay, like this is this is going to be pretty dicey after about like fifty or sixty laps, and it just it just wasn't i'm 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 absolutely flabbergasted all right well you'll have to call your buddies over there at the uh, jet propulsion laboratory and see if they can figure it out and by the way uh Oof. race race control is asking for tire samples as well so uh we'll wait for the <laughs> analysis on those but uh brian congratulations right. on the win uh, fantastic drive tonight leading 55 circuits around here. Uh, congratulations on it. And uh, before we let you go, do all those sponsor plugs and shout outs. All right. Uh, first off, got to thank uh, Team Watson Racing. Uh, the uh, NASA and JPL logos on the side of the car, uh, you know, they, they do mean something there. Everything on there is, uh, is valuable uh, to the greater experience of everything. Uh, thank you to you guys for the broadcast, all the fellow racers with, for the great camaraderie, um, everybody watching at home. I uh, hope you guys are having a great evening. All right, buddy. Well, thank you much. We appreciate you coming to hang out with us up here in the booth. And, uh, now let's see, we're going to go talk to, uh, we'll make it our runner up finisher, Mr. James Watson. Uh, we'll bring James up into the booth here with us. James, congratulations. As much as Brian hated seeing that late caution, you had to be pretty jacked up getting a uh, a look at that one. Uh, kind of, not really. Uh, I knew that, uh, that Steven had pitted later, so I knew that he was going to have fresh retires. So uh, I, I guess it worked out. I had less time that I needed to... Uh, less time i had to worry about holding him off but yeah i i wasn't quite thrilled because i really didn't think i i had anything had anything for brian it's just too quick uh well it, it seemed like your car was really good on the early run i mean you led a race high 101 laps tonight was there any thought process to maybe doing something alternate on strategy uh, whether that was going earlier than you did, going later than you did, it, it seemed like you got out with a nice gap. Uh, I mean, just one of those instances where his car was an absolute rocket ship tonight. Yeah, the fact that I was saving as much as I could and I, I was still having issues holding him off, I I knew that it, it painted a, a big picture of my... Uh, my race how the race was gonna play out and I, I didn't i wanted to stay out later i couldn't have really stayed out any longer than i could have i only had like not a whole lot of fuel left 
So, um, I suppose I could have done Steven, Steven's strategy, but with how hard it, it, it was to pass and having the clean air, I felt like my best plan of attack was pitting when I did. Honestly, I expected Brian to pit sooner than... I expected Brian to try to undercut me, so that was uh, that that was my my number one strategy was what I did, and I really don't any other strategy played out any better. Well, the car was absolutely fantastic tonight, Jameson, and this is going to play big in the championship hopes as we get later in the season. Uh, Wes having an issue very early tonight. Jason going out of the race. Uh, you you have to be at least a little bit happy thinking big picture at the end of this one. Yeah, I, I'm disappointed that I didn't get the win because that would have been a lot more extra point. But um, all all things considered, this was this was a day I needed after uh, after uh, the last two races looking like they were going to be good only to end up not being good so yeah it's nice to uh it's nice to get a few breaks for this one i uh i'm grateful for this one well james congratulations on it once again here and uh get all those sponsor plugs and shout outs in for us before we let you out of here yeah i gotta thank everyone at team watson set up showed watson 39 for 10 percent off checkout uh, you and everyone else at the National Racing Network, Mark Sports, Sim Racing Apparel, uh, Boomer Butt Boxes, and my folks for watching at home. <laughs> James sounds absolutely exhausted. We're not used to seeing that out of him at 10 of 11 at night. He's usually just kicking off here. But, James, congratulations once again on the podium, brother. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Uh, coming to hang out with us up here in the booth and uh, one more victory lane interview to get through here i think it's our first time talking to this guy unless you talked to him last week bizzle but uh daniel miglin joining us up here in the booth now congratulations uh, a really good run that car absolutely came alive on that second set of tires at the late race caution yeah i i realized very quickly in the first stint that uh, I burned up my stuff way too quick. I thought it was going to be a pretty caution-heavy race. That was wrong. So the second <laughs> stint, I just tried to uh, save my stuff. Uh, I, I feel like I would have had a pretty good finish even if we didn't have that late caution. But once I saw that caution came out, even with only three or four minutes left, I knew... If I was going to stay on the lead lap, I might as well take him and see what happens. Yeah, ultimately the call turned out to be the right one, coming back onto the track in the eighth position and very quickly slicing your way up to third. Did you think about going something crazy on James there with, with just a couple of laps to go, or was third good enough by that point? So I was definitely going for it. On the second to last lap, so the lap preceding the white flag, actually bumped him pretty good in four. That was the point at which I decided I'm going to settle in and just finish the race. <laughs> well, it, it was one hell of a show that you put on. That is for sure. Uh, congratulations on the podium here, Daniel. And uh, but real quick, give us those sponsor plugs and shout outs before we let you out of here. Uh, thank you to my wife, Emily. She's great. Thank you. Uh, that's it. I thought I had more, but that's it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You know what? Make sure you shout the wife out. That is always important. Keep her, uh, keep on the good side of the bride, and uh, good things happen for you. All right, Daniel, congratulations once again on the podium. As we'll go back to the live look here and wrap up our double header night here on the National Racing Network. And Bizzle, we had a fantastic show in the sprint cars uh, and ultimately a race that could have gone either way here in the TNT shock series turned out to be absolutely fantastic yeah Nashville I, I had a feeling this was going to be a great show tonight and this track just it's one of the most fun in the country I can't wait to see hopefully some top level racing come back here Yes, uh, NASCAR and, and Speedway Motorsports are working very hard on that um, 
we will see how how that shakes out here over the next couple of years. But yeah, I, I think you'll see the Nashville Fairgrounds back on the NASCAR National Touring Series schedule sooner than later. Um, it, it's just too perfect of a facility to not have racing at. Uh, and quite frankly, we got more coming up this week too. Tomorrow night we are off. Thursday night, these PM18 cars run the officials, the USF Pro Championship. Heading off to the streets of Long Beach to kick off your IndyCar Grand Prix of Long Beach weekend. That one is going to, it's always a great show at Long Beach. It's kind of the spa of street circuits, if you will. Then next week, we head off to Legacy Phoenix, Monday and Tuesday night. The Silver Crowns, 9.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The Sprint Cars, Tuesday, 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. TNT Shock Series is off. They will return two weeks from tonight with a visit to Five Flags Speedway. Another track that always puts on a great race here with the TNT Shot guys. But with that, time for Bizzle and I to get the heck on out of here. For Patrick and everybody else here at the National Racing Network that makes these shows happen, my name is Chris Graham. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, and we'll talk to you all soon. Have a great night, everybody.